Hi guys, Mary D here, and um, I appreciate all the love and all of the well wishes for those of you have that have been watching the uh, Facebook Lives that I've had with um, Dr. Marvin and that have showed up on my page as well on Facebook. And I've been getting a lot of questions because um, obviously I didn't make my um, diagnosis very public until very recently. And a lot of you are reaching out and asking. And so in, in an effort to not have to repeat myself many, many times, I thought I would make a video. And then that way you guys can hear the story straight from me. And um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about um, the questions that have been asked, which are how did you find your lump? And what did you do uh, when you found out it was cancer? And how did you choose your diagnosis? Uh, or, or your path of, um, of what you chose to do. So I wanna share all that with you here today and I'll share it with you in little chunks to make this a little more digestible. But um, anyway, I am 40 years old. Yeah, I turned 40 years old in 2017. And so in line with that, I went and had my well woman back in September. And then in October, I was reaching over to do a stretch um, and during that stretch, I went to like pull something off of my shirt and happened to feel that I had a little lump. And so I, I did a self breast exam and in feeling around, um, I felt a very distinct lump and people's first question to me is how did you know, like, how do you know a cancerous lump from a, just a lump in general? Cause breasts are lumpy. Let's be honest. Breasts are very lumpy. And, and, and that's how I felt in the past. So I'll tell you that in the past, I've certainly felt like when I'm fishing around to do a, a self breast exam, that breasts are lumpy. And how will I know if it's just, you know, lumpy breasts or if it's actually some, something that I should be aware of. And I've kind of dismissed it quite honestly uh, until that day that I was leaning forward and <clears throat> actually felt very distinctly um, the, the roundness of what was in my breast. So what I will tell you is it was very obvious to me that it wasn't like any of the other lumps that were in or around my breasts. It was very smooth to the touch and the best way I can describe it is that it was similar to like a marble, how a marble is smooth on the outside, but it wasn't quite as hard. It wasn't hard like a marble, but it definitely had that smoothness. Um, if any of you have had a boba, which I love bobas, it kind of reminded me of a boba, but much larger. And because it was um, on the skin, I could feel it. It was to the nine o'clock of my nipple and uh, maybe about an inch over. Uh, and so, <clears throat> I called my OBGYN and said, hey, thanks for, you know, my earlier well woman uh, this year, but I think I have a lump and I think I need you to check it out. So I went in and saw her mid-November uh, before Thanksgiving and she also checked my breasts and said, yeah, definitely feels like something. Let's, let's have you sent off for a mammogram. Um, earlier in April, I had gotten a thermogram. Thermograms are widely used in Europe. Um, they're non-invasive and they're, a, they're not considered an alternative to mammograms, but in the holistic community, they're something that are used a little bit more and, um, and they're safe for all ages. So um, anyone can use them. And again, they kind of, they show you a lot more than just what's going on in your breasts. They, they get, can give an overall um, assessment of the body. So for me, um, I did have that back in April of this year and my breasts did come up as red under kind of like in this side and then over here where um, the breast cancer showed up. But it was one of those things where it was like, yeah, definitely have it looked at, but uh, you know, nothing was bothering me. And at the time I was wearing wire bras and so I stopped wearing wire bras thinking that the blood flow that we were seeing and the temperature offset might be caused from wire bras. But again, I have my well woman in September and then my checkup in November after I found that lump. So anyway, I went ahead and uh, had my mammogram right after Thanksgiving, uh, right on the 28th of November. And during the mammogram, uh, it was interesting because I was a little conflicted because I knew mammograms give off um, radiation uh, they're not great for you. If you have cancer, you don't want to keep radiating, you know, any cancers in your body. Um, but I just dismissed it as, you know, it's a one-time thing. I'm going to get checked out and, and I'll be done. Um, in addition to that, they were doing an ultrasound as well. So when they did the uh, initial mammogram, what was interesting to me is they did um, check my first, my right breast out first. 
then she did my left breast and then she said you know what let's go back and do the right breast one more time she's like I want to make sure that I got a good image and that for a moment made me go that's interesting that she would ask to do it again and clearly she sees something that um, is to her attention that makes her you know want to to go back and look at it again so a little you know disheartening but at the same time I was like no big let's Let's get it done and so I can get out of here. So during the mammogram, the tech, as she's talking to me, lets me know, she's like, by the way, she was like, after your ultrasound, um, you will talk to the radiologist today, so you're gonna know before you leave. And I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna know what before I leave. Um, but that was a little bit of foreboding for what was going to come. And what, what it made me think of in hindsight was my um, when I was learning about thermography many years ago, the gal in the office who was the tech who does the thermograms has been doing it so long that when they see things like cancer show up in the breast, they are so used to what it looks like uh, in certain cases, like the really obvious ones that she knows right away. And she says that to this day, she still has to leave the room because she will get a little teary eyed before she comes back to finish the, the thermogram. And that's actually what it made me think of in this case that this mammogram tech has been doing this so long that she sees something and she says, oh, I know what this is. Um, so again, that's my hindsight. But at the time I, again, just dismissed it, moved on to the ultrasound and the, the tech as she is um, working on only my right breast, which is fine because that was the one where the, the questionable lump was she got very quiet and very serious. And so she wasn't chatty. Like I said, she was taking quite a few images. She was taking her time and it was literally laying there that my little like, you know, feelers went out and said, something is definitely happening right now. I feel like everyone in this office knows what's going on except for me. And, and that part ended up being being true. So the next thing you know, the radiologist comes in and he was very serious and I'm sure he's done this, does this many times a day. So that's why his bedside manner is um, objective and non-emotional. And he says to me, yeah, let's take a look. And he puts up my, uh, you know, grabs the, the ultrasound machine and puts it over my breast where the lump is and says, yeah, do you see this spot right here? And he's pointing it out. He says, this is um, this is looking this you know looks like cancer and uh, we, we don't know you know what kind or or what really uh, what else to tell you but we'll need to biopsy it to take a look and then he leaves the room uh, <laughs> and it happens that quickly I believe it took him under a minute to to tell me to tell me that information so as you can imagine it's pretty uh, at that point it's I'm processing because number one I'm kind of shocked because before I went into that office, I thought, yeah, let's just get this checked out so we can get our, our check mark of a bill of health and walk out of here. So I'm a little stunned and they immediately take me out and, um, and send me to the room next door, which is with Carmen. And Carmen is a lovely um, counselor type lady who is there to, she's definitely the woman that's there for I'm sure when people are hysterical or when they're crying or when they're trying to figure out what their emotions are, they talk to her because she's super understanding and sort of the first words out of her mouth are, I'm not even going to ask. She's like, I'm just going to schedule you for the very next appointment that we have. <laughs> she's like, not what you thought you were coming here to hear today, was it? And uh, and like I said, she was, she was very nurturing, but at the same time, for me, I have to process my feelings. I'm, I'm not overly, um, I don't jump to conclusions right away. I tend to want to have enough information to make a good decision or to, to sort through my feelings. And at that point, I um, was definitely, you know, teary eyed, but not, um, not overly upset, just a little shocked. Like I said, that, that's probably the best way to describe it is I was just in shock. Because number one, the first thing running through my mind was how does he know that it's cancer? Number one, like how does he know? Like no one's really looked at it. What if it was, I don't know, calcium in the breasts or um, a benign tumor? Like if, it, if it's clearly a tumor, how does he know whether it's cancerous or not? So those were kind of my rationales with myself in terms of of saying mm, that doesn't sound like that's a very 
positive thing to say to somebody when you're not really sure because how can he really be sure so anyway a few days later I go in for a biopsy and they stick a needle into my breast and they biopsy a piece of um, the tumor out so that they can send it off for a sample to confirm exactly the size and the um, type that uh, of, of tumor that it is and at that time it was such an interesting experience because uh, I actually didn't feel the needle at all. They were like, click stick, and I'm like waiting. <laughs> and I'm like, did you stick me yet? And they're like, yes, we're already in there. I'm like, okay. Uh, they also stick a marker in there. So it's a marker um, that basically is about the the size of the uh, pinhead uh, of, a, of, a, of a pen. And, uh, and they stick that in there so that it will show up on things like ultrasounds and mammograms. Uh, so that they can say this is the spot where you know we've already investigated and so um, they leave a little titanium piece in there to um, to mark the spot and uh, and the marker of course uh, is a little bit bigger than uh, a second marker that's a little bit larger so that when they do surgery which is interesting that they're already kind of on that path then they can easily locate it and know where to go so that there's no question so uh, again these are I'm being moved right along. It's kind of an interesting, you know, um, journey. Um, at that point, I had had no discharge from my nipple, and they kept asking me that. They're like, hey, have you had discharge from your nipple? And I'm like, no. I mean, honestly, if I'd never felt this bump and come in, I wouldn't know that this was anything. And so they went ahead, and uh, uh, after they did the, the biopsy, of course, there's, there's you know, blood, and so they put a lot of pressure to make sure that uh, the blood stopped. Um, but what was weird to me is when I sat up, blood actually started coming out of my nipple, uh, which had never happened before. So it was just kind of this awkward moment of like, well, you guys have been asking me if I've had any nipple discharge and I haven't until you did this biopsy. So at that point, you know, I was reading enough uh, stuff on the internet about different breast cancers to realize that it must be in my ducts. Whatever it is, it's inside the, the ducts of the breast, like where the milk would come if you had a baby uh, or if your breasts were, were, if you were lactating. And so sure enough, the doctor just confirmed that. He says, oh yeah, it's because, you know, obviously we were, you know, taking the biopsy. So the blood is just making its way out the most natural way that it can. And um, what sort of freaked me out is that my um, the upper so the the tumor is up to the nine o'clock of my nipple so if you imagine that you know this is the nipple and the tumor is here on this opposite side here it actually started to sink my nipple sunk in a little bit and I was like whoa what is happening like my nipples all deformed my boob is starting to be deformed but it only lasted like a few seconds and then it went back to normal and I found that to be really kind of awkward too um, so it was a very odd experience but what I want to tell you is from the time that I left the doctor's office for the mammogram from the mammogram and ultrasound when they told me I had cancer to the days that I had to wait to have the biopsy, those were really tough uh, because again, in my mind, I don't have enough information other than, oh, by the way, you have cancer. And there's things that run through your mind. You wonder, okay, well, what kind do I have and like what stage is it? Because that's kind of important to know. Um, I had a brother-in-law that passed away from gastric cancer and he was stage four and that's a lot different than someone who was sta say a stage one so kind of important information to know because then you start thinking about time and, uh, and the things that matter of course uh, because you don't know how much how little or how much time that you might possibly have obviously none of us are promised tomorrow but in the in the grand scheme of everything is going normally then we you know how much time do we have so that's that's the first thing that I was sort of, you know, wondering, but I tried not to dwell on things too much uh, because again, I didn't have enough information and I said, let's just keep moving along here until we can get enough information. So after that, um, I ha had to wait for the biopsy results and that took some time. So I had that biopsy on December the 1st and then by December the 6th, I was literally in the car on my way to the airport and my husband was driving, my niece was in the back and the lady calls from the mammography place and she says, oh, Miss D, can you, uh, I have your results 
and I'd like to share them with you. And I said, okay, that's great. And she says, are you driving? And I said, yes, I sure am. I'm driving to the airport. She says, well, I'm going to need you to pull over. And I explained to her, I said, well, I'm not driving. I'm the passenger, but you're, that's fine. Let's, let's talk about this. And then she says, okay. She goes, are you somewhere, you know, private? And I said, it's fine. I said, you're you know, on Bluetooth in the car. Let's, let's do this. Let's talk about this. And so then she proceeds to tell me that I have ductal carcinoma. And that means nothing to me, by the way. At that point, I had no idea what that was. Um, because if you try to read about breast cancer on the internet, when, you, all you, all, when the only statement you've gotten is you have breast cancer, then there are about a million and one options of what it could be. So, you know, it's, it's not worth it to stress out. Uh, over trying to research breast cancers because you just don't know what it is. And that's where I was at. I had just sort of stopped, you know, trying to figure out what I even thought it would be. Um, so anyway, she tells me I have ductal, ductal carcinoma. I immediately Google it so that I can see what it is. And I said to her, okay, well, can you tell me, like, is there a number associated with it? Is there a stage associated with it? Can you tell me more about it? And she says, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have that information. She's like, but we would like to schedule you with a specialist. And the specialist will tell you all about it and she'll be able to tell you that information. And I said, okay, so the specialist, um, when can I see her? And she's like, well, um, you know, we get that scheduled. And so what it is is the specialist is a surgeon. So it's interesting that they use the word specialist because it's great that they're a specialist, but they are actually a surgeon. So the fact that they're scheduling me, scheduling me with a surgeon tells me, okay, this must be pretty serious. Um, so while uh, I hang up with her, and, and this is what, what I really um, remember most about the conversation is she was literally like waiting. You could tell she was waiting for some sort of response from me or some sort of like um, emotion. And I was pretty emotionless about it. I was like, great, let's make an appointment. I said, just, um, I, you know, I work from home. Uh, I'm not on any particular schedule. I said, just schedule me, whatever the, her next available is. I'm back in town, you know, on this, this date next week. So just schedule it and call me back and let me know what the time is and I'll show up. And she was just kind of like, okay. And, uh, and like I said, you could tell she was such sort of like waiting for more, but I didn't have any more for her. I was just very, you know, let's make an appointment and go from there. So anyway, um, that week was really interesting because I had, um, I was at a funeral for a friend, a very close friend of the family. Um, and at the same time I was out in the Santa Barbara area. And as it so happens, there is a center, a holistic center called Issels that's out in the Santa Barbara area. And I had started to do some research, um, because I said, well, let's talk about alternatives to alternative treatments for cancer. Let's just start getting some education around what those could be and what they might be. And so uh, it was funny that we happened to be journeying out there because I got a call from them. And uh, what was really nice is that the gentleman on the phone was able to put my mind at ease about a few things in terms of just talking about uh, different breast cancers and sometimes the origins and causes and uh, walking me through some holistic measures that I can take that are good for me that, uh, you know, would be to my benefit in terms of, uh, you know, doing things like juicing, uh, looking into things like um, Gerson therapy, which any of you that have cancer or have had family that have it have probably seen that or heard of it and looked at it. And so anyway, it was nice because he quite honestly gave me a lot more um, information and at least something to busy myself with that was more hopeful than, uh, than anything that the traditional uh, system had given me at that point. So it was nice to hear from them. And then uh, I just started making more calls and setting more appointments with different holistic centers and alternative, alternative treatment centers because that was important for me to do my research and get as much information as I could. So as I looked up ductal uh, carcinoma, um, it was interesting because there are two kind that pop up when you Google that word. One is in situ, which is a basically like a pre-cancer. It's not even really cancer yet. It's just sort of a, hey, it's available over here. It could happen. And then there's another one, which is called invasive ductal carcinoma, which means it is inside um, the breast. It's actually cancer and it has the ability to grow and to spread. And then there are, of course, different stages of what that is. So again, even though I have, at least I know what it's called, 
I still don't have enough information. I still don't know what stage it is. I don't know uh, if it's spread anywhere. I don't know if it's just in one spot. So it, it's, uh, you know, you can imagine the um, emotional toll that this can take on people. And um, again, because I'm, I'm not, um, I, I need more information and I have to process, I don't have enough of those details yet. And uh, I'm just kind of taking it all with a grain of salt. And I'm like, okay, now I have to wait to talk to this surgeon. So uh, we leave for the week and I end up uh, going to see the surgeon on the Friday that I'm back. And uh, this was December the 15th. So as you can tell, my month of December was a little rough going into holidays with all of this new information. But um, on the 15th, I met with, uh, with the doctor. She's uh, a little bit younger than I am. I had been doing um, specialized in breasts for about 11 years. And it was really interesting to me because she has my um, pictures up on a screen where we can, you know, see, see a little circle and the marker and all that good stuff. And then she's got a whiteboard on the other side and on the, the whiteboard, she's basically gonna give me the presentation about what kind of cancer it is and what stage and all that good stuff. And uh, my mind was actually somewhere else, unfortunately. My dog was very sick and a vet from Laps of Love was coming over that afternoon to uh, see her over the Rainbow Bridge. So it was, it was a lot for that Friday, but uh, you know, I didn't interrupt her. I said, yeah, go ahead, do your presentation. It's you know, clear to me that she had a, a set, uh, you know, when she gets a diagnosis for someone and she has to present to them what their options are, she has kind of these, you know, set, um, presentations that she gives and that was kind of funny to me but anyway she explains that it is uh, invasive ductal carcinoma and uh, it's a stage two but it's a very like or it was almost like a it's a, a almost like an advanced stage one because uh, the only thing making it a stage two is the fact that it's over two centimeters so it's 2.3 centimeters and if you look at my paperwork it's 2.2 2.3 they're they're all guessing that it's right in there. Um, so because it's over two, that is actually what makes it a stage two. It's a grade two, which means it's not um, not on the radar, but it's not too crazy. It's just sort of right in the middle, which again, that's not a, not a, a very clinical explanation. Uh, and then she goes on to tell me that it is progesterone and um, estrogen positive, which means that when my body, um, my body feeds the cancer through estrogen and progesterone. And one of the things that that made me think back to was the fact that I was on the Depo Provera shot for almost 10 years straight. Uh, it was my preferred birth control in my 20s. And that of course does, um, has a progesterone release to it um, that obviously you know plays with your hormones a little bit. So it made me wonder if that might've been a factor. Um, one of the other factors that they uh, presented to me as uh, a high risk in this area is the fact that I haven't had any children and uh, I haven't honestly I haven't even ever been pregnant so not having been pregnant and not having children was kind of another factor that played into that and then there was a question mark on whether it was in my genetics my grandfather had prostate cancer my dad had prostate cancer um, they both passed from those diseases uh, my father did not bear any sons and so it's hard to know if um, as that third generation uh, since I am a female if it ended up showing up as breast cancer because no one on either side that I'm aware of has had breast cancer in my family so um, they sent me off for genetics testing as well and uh, although reassuring me that that was very very unlikely that I would come back as positive um, for having it the um, having it in my my genetic history genetic profile I guess but the the next step that we took is the uh, as she's explaining which kind of breast cancer it is and how it works she's explaining to me my options and basically I have three options and the options are I can have a lumpectomy which means they will just take out um, they take out the cancer and they take out a area around the cancer of good tissue also to make sure that they've cleaned it all up. They also sample your lymph nodes to make sure that it hasn't gotten um, past the breast 
into any other areas. And then that would be followed by six weeks of radiation. And radiation would entail me going to uh, the doctor's office every day, six days a week for six weeks uh, for about 10 minutes so they can basically spot radiate that area, which can lead to um, like a sun, almost like a sunburn on the breast. Um, it has a tendency to ruin the skin, and so it makes uh, any other operations on that breast, um, especially if it comes to anything cosmetic, very difficult. So that was the first option. Second option was a mastectomy, which would mean they take out all of the breast tissue in this right breast, and I could proceed to get an implant or just wear a, a prosthesis in a, in a bra, um, and so that bore the question for me of, well, you know, what if I wanted to um, go ahead and get a lift in, you know, to make things sort of match up? And she says, oh, she goes, that's a good question. You'll have to talk to plastics. And that's what they call the plastic surgeon. You talk plastics. And I said, okay. So she um, made me a referral to talk to a plastic surgeon. Um, and I'm glad I actually asked that question because had I not asked it, I'm wondering if we would have ever gotten there. But anyway, the third choice was a bilateral mastectomy, which means getting rid of both um, breasts. And there's a, a, you know, they give you statistics. The problem with statistics uh, is that they're not very specific. As someone who has been um, an online marketer for a, for a while now, it's my brain starts to go to very specific pinpoints and behaviors. So when they tell me specifics, like when they say, oh, a lumpectomy and a mastectomy have similar, um, you know, percentiles of recurrence, then I go, okay. Uh, or when they say you have a particular um, uh, chance of, of living 10 more years, that's a really vague statistic for me. Like that's that's not a that's not an answer because the questions I start to have are are these women my age? Are these stage one breast cancer, stage two, stage three, stage four? Are you lumping them all together? Um, are these Asian American women? Are these women who are progesterone and estrogen positive um, the same that I am? Uh, you know. I start really trying to break down these statistics that they're giving me. And the, the one that was most important to me was quality of life. So are you telling me that these people survived 10 more years because they were, you know, suffering with chemotherapy and laid in bed for 10, for the next 10 years? Or are these people who were healthy and whole and outliving their life um, for at least another 10 years? Um, these are the questions that the doctor couldn't answer for me and it's it's really disturbing to me to think that as long as this disease has been around and um, all cancers for that matter that they wouldn't have more specific uh, even even whether it's to the age of the person or certain markers and I, I get that cancer is different for everyone but at the same time there are some similarities and there are things that we can you know break down demographics just like we do in marketing when we're looking for target mark for a target market um, for our customers or for our products so this was was a little bit disturbing to me in the in the way that I'm thinking to myself surely someone is keeping track of this and so where is this person and and, and uh, can I see those statistics? Or do they not share those statistics because they don't make the numbers look as good? Uh, which leads me to the next question, which is does this make more doctors funnel women who are stage one and stage through through these um, through the system and make them more, uh, you know, call out these cancers as being more aggressive than maybe they are in an effort to, uh, in, in knowing maybe that, you know, stage one and stage two have longer longer lifespans and so they want to put more of those into the the kitty so that it ups the stats so again this is this is just my mind going to all these places of like you know what's the real number here and what are some real statistics because i don't feel like i'm getting them so i left that doctor's appointment with my three options and right away in my mind what i said to myself was i really want to preserve my um good breast and I, want to I don't want to make a healthy body sick. 
And some of you are like, Mary, you have cancer. How are your, how is your body healthy? Well, what I'll tell you is that up until this point in my entire life, I have no history or um, issues with disease or immune issues, or I, mean, I barely get sick. I don't even have a primary care physician. I, at least I didn't until this last month. And so those are, that's why I say that because I don't feel sick. Um, I wasn't feeling, you know, bad. Um, I wasn't someone like you see on TV that has cancer, my hair wasn't falling out, like I don't, didn't have any of those things. If I hadn't found this lump and gone and got it checked out and they hadn't told me that it was cancerous, I, right now I would be, you know, doing what I normally do and just not thinking twice about that part of, uh, that part of it, of cancer. So anyway, um, I left there and that was, that was my initial feeling. But at the same time, my next feeling was, okay, so I'm going to do a lumpectomy, but I'm not interested in radiation or chemotherapy at all, just because I know they're toxic to the body. And again, I don't want to take a healthy, everything else that's healthy and make it sick just to fix one, one thing. Um, my f loved one's reaction was hit it with everything you can. <laughs> so it's interesting to um, go through that process as well and seeing what your family and friends, uh, their initial reaction versus sometimes what yours might be. And in my case, uh, it was a little opposite. And again, I felt like I needed to get more information. So I leave there and I wasn't feeling that hot about that particular doctor. Uh, my appointment to see the plastic surgeon was not until after the new year. So from the 15th of December all the way through the holidays and the new year, um, I made a lot of phone calls and talked to a lot of doctors, um, mostly in the holistic realm, a lot of them in Mexico. I uh, did a lot of reading and did a lot of soul searching. And through that process, one thing that became really, really apparent to me 